Restart my mother fucking clock. Put numbers on the clock. Yeah. I put numbers on the motherfucking clock. Ooh. Numbers on the clock. Clocks on the numbers. It's gonna be a hot summer. When you dance, when you move. Hey, you gotta dance with your shoes. Ooh, if your shoes is dirty, I come home early. Had an old chick name was Shirley. Her hair was kind of short and kind of curly. Oh, smoothie. Rubbing on her legs, not her booty. Might go dancing. There's no chance in no romancing, man. Hold up. Hit the brakes. Your bitch ride skates. Said, hold on. Hit the brakes. Your bitch drive skates. That's what she do. She doesn't have a car. She doesn't have a towel. Yeah. That's just how we living over here, man. I'm talking about real black. I'm talking about, like, at your mama house, that grease that sit on the stove all the time. That's how black we are. I'm talking about... I'm talking about, like, that Christmas when you know you ain't getting shit black. <laughs> Right. I'm talking about getting a whooping at the barbershop black. You know how black this about to be kept? Bring me my change back black. <laughs> yep. This shit right here. This shit is for all the people who get to work before your partners and clock them in, too. Yeah. <laughs> this was supposed to be the summer that Hunching came back out, Cat. You know that, right? Nah, this summer was supposed to be the summer Hunching was supposed to make his comeback. I don't know if you heard. <laughs> we about to make some shit happen. Y'all almost ready? I can tell. How you living, G? I'm good, bro. How about you, son? Man, welcome to the trap spot. <laughs> welcome to the trap spot! I don't know if you heard, I don't know if you know, I don't know if you're privy to the information, but right now, the black market is open! Sing Man, we got, we got somebody real dope and cool in here with us, man. You know what I'm saying? Just to throw a few titles out. You know, he's a digital media content creator. You know, very well-established journalist, writer, documentary, filmmaker, uh, cool-ass nigga who always on the scene. He always know what's going on. I see the nigga on Twitter talking shit all the time. He'd be like, I'd like, hear like my most ghetto tweet, then some political shit. I'd be like, what this nigga got going on? <laughs> <laughs> hey, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the trap. My man, Torin Walker. How you living? I'm good, bro. I'm good. Nice time. Good, man. Welcome to the trap once again, formally. How you been? I've been good, man. Now that the world's starting to open up, you know, and get back out of here and breathe a little bit more. What you been up to? Oh, man. Um, really just getting back into um, doing my journalism again. I had to do a lot of things remotely. Yeah. And that was getting on my nerves. And now I can go out and actually see people face to face. So I'm doing that again. That's good. Yeah. And what type of journalism you been up to during this, this pandemic? Doing a lot of interviews. Um, I managed to connect with some people who had been um, rocking with the things I do. And so I set up, since I couldn't go out to um, do interviews anymore, I set up a 
Context Media website channel and a YouTube channel. So I just started doing Zooms and talking to people about some of the things that we were cared about. Bruh, black journalists out here be catching hell. Well, yeah. Like we saw you know, a lot of press conferences where, you know, the old president, he just ignored the black lady questions most of the time. Yeah, but you know what? You got to expect that from somebody like that. Right. I think what people have to really pay attention to is being um, wary of people who pretend to be your friend and will invite you in and still don't answer your question, but they'll smile at you. Mm. Damn, bro, I never even knew that black journalism was that hard. Maybe all the black journalists should just focus on investigative reports then. Nah, you know, you got, you got black journalists in every different genre of journalism. It's just that the ones that tend to um, get more shine are the ones who do more sensationalism. Like, you know, celebrity media is always going to sell. You're never going to get tired of that. Shit, I did. Word? I'm tired of it. I don't give a shit. <laughs> These people are regular as hell if you look at it. Yeah, but you know, most people like that stuff because you know it's sensational and it's, it's just like watching reality TV. You know, people yeah. love that stuff, they eat it up. Yeah. And there's a place for it, but it's so prevalent that you can't really move anywhere else on that. That's real. I mean, I guess. There's a lot of people who thrive off the celebrity gossip and shit, whether it's real or fake. I guess it's just the illusion of somebody living a better life than you that makes them feed into that shit. Well, you know, it's an escape for some people. And, you know, it's nothing wrong with going on and taking a look at what's going on with somebody for a while, you know, for a couple minutes and then moving on to something else. But because there's so much of it and they keep pumping that stuff out on a daily basis, 24-7, you can't yeah. really, there's no room for nothing else. Uh -huh. I mean, there is, but they don't want to do that. Yeah. Man, you, bro, you got your, your work featured in a book about cyberbullying. Mm-hmm. You think that's real? I think it's real to the point where you got to understand there's a lot of people, there's a whole generation that grew up online and they don't know anything else. And there's a lot of people who don't really have any sort of outside stimulus outside of being online all the time, literally. Mm -hmm. I mean, you go outside, you see people all day, you see kids in the strollers like doing this. They don't know anything else. So if your world is in there and all of a sudden you say something that somebody doesn't like, and then they create this mob that attacks you, then yeah, cyberbullying is real at that point. Now, if you're 18 and up, yeah, I don't really believe in it that much. Right. You can always turn the, um, you can always cut your phone off. I think I've been bullied by every demographic of people out there on social media. I think I probably have individually upset, except the indigenous people. They let everything slide. <laughs> You know what, if you have any kind of presence on social media, anything you say is gonna make somebody mad at some point. I know. So you can either end up being so wishy-washy that you don't stand on anything, or you can just be who you are and just keep it moving. They'll find something else to be mad about in a day or so. Oh, man. That's crazy. People really think that you give a fuck about their opinions. Some people do. You know what I mean? You know, some people are so tied into social media and they're so tied into being in that cyber world that they really do believe in it. Some people don't, but they pretend that they do because it looks good. Just like some people pretend to care about certain causes and they really don't, you know? Yeah, I ain't one of them people. There's a lot of shit in this world that needs saving, but I think we gotta save the black people first. You know, that's a controversial opinion depending on who you ask. I don't give a fuck. These people ain't gonna do nothing. We gotta save the black people, man. Black people are fucking... I don't even know what the county is right now. I know it's a lot of us left, but leave us alone. We got enough shit to worry about. We gotta save us, man. Everybody else save themselves. They keep saying that that's the way to go, so we just gonna have to save ourselves. But you know what? You go to every other um, demographic, everybody else knows that, except yeah. us. Yeah. We're supposed to be everybody's life preserver, and we're supposed to come save everybody else, but when it's time for us to get something, we get nothing. Yeah, we need some shit, too. We need a lot. Yeah, just like, you know, like some basic civil human rights, you know, we still just need, we go out, we probably got about 30 or 40 more civil rights we gotta get. Then we can start, like, really enjoying some of this shit. But they cheated us out a lot of them. Yeah. Well, America's gonna always be America, that's not gonna change. I feel you, I feel you. But at some point, some shit gonna change. I hope we're just old enough to see it. That's the cold shit, like, I don't know. You know, there's no, way to, there's no way to determine that, you know. There's people, you know, 200 years ago in the field who thought they would never get any further than that, you know what I mean? They were fighting and they would run away, but they only were trying to run away for their own freedom and try to take care of their individual needs. They never thought that they'd see people who were black lawyers and black doctors, 
or, you know, black politicians or black people who ran corporations, you know what I mean? We may not see them. I don't even think we got enough of them yet. Some of them people are so disappointed. Because they get on TV and you be like, oh, they those kind of black people. So it's kind of like they not even that. There's a lot of misrepresentation out there. Just, I don't think we should just have to accept people just because of, like, on our behalf, just because of that. If they don't have our interests, at, you know, on the forefront, then they just, they just as bad as the motherfuckers you're trying to replace. We got a real bad habit of doing that, though. We get caught up in the idea of representation, and because somebody's black that they, and they look like us, that they're going to take care of us, but... I think if we just have been having a whole lot of the wrong kind of black people put in the positions that we wanted to see real black people in. Well, if you, if you try to be a real black person, you're not going to get that far, unless you hide who you are until you get to a position where you can do what you want to do. Exactly, man. But it's a certain level of realness that's got to be in anybody in any profession. You just can't go along and get along with everything. Yeah, you can. That's not healthy, though. That doesn't, that doesn't, that's not progress. If you just accept anything and let anything be, then what are you doing? Taking care of the wallets? I mean, that's, you know, that's what I mean. People got to get out of this idea that just because somebody looks like you, they're for you, you know what I mean? Exactly. A lot of people say everything that they, people say stuff that sounds good, and they say things that they think people want to hear, but they're out for their bottom line. That's just the truth. That's, that's it, and that's the corporation of how most of this shit works. Mm -hmm. You got to look out for that bottom line. And journalism is some of the worst of that. Mm. Like, what are some of the things that you have to, that you have to experience on that side of the journalism? They know that the public may not be privy to. All right. Um, I started out in journalism working for mainstream news. Um, okay. I worked for Huffington Post. I worked for a couple other mainstream outlets. And right what about was the that experience like? Because sometimes Huffington Post, they post some great shit, and then sometimes you'd be like, who the fuck let this come out? <laughs> You was letting that shit come out. Yeah, hell no, nah. wasn't me. You, but you know exactly what I'm talking about. Sometimes that shit would be so left, like, who the fuck okayed this? And then it's a credible news place too. It's like, ah, shit, Huffington Post, y'all meant that one. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what my story, my um, experience was. I started writing for Huffington Post right about the time when um, Mike Brown got killed in Ferguson. Mm. So the beat I was on was like, um, basically, for lack of a better term, the race beat. It was like, cause you know, like every other week somebody was getting killed, you know, and there was a story and there was a protest and there was an uprising. So I was on a lot of those stories. While that was a hot story, nobody really bothered with me that much. But then once you started seeing those court cases start coming to pass, I wanted to start trying to cover those. And that's when I started getting pushed back because it was like, it wasn't a hot story to talk about what was going on in the courts. It was a hot story to go out there with a camera and just shoot people throwing stuff at the police and quote unquote setting stuff on fire and um, doing all this and creating damage. They loved that but nobody really wants to talk about what happens after that. You know, how cops get off after, you know, they basically can kill somebody in the street and walk out with their gun and get not guilty verdicts. They don't want to talk about that. So I had a lot of pushback with editors for that sort of thing. Mm. That, and I had to deal with a lot of editors who weren't really from the culture who were trying to tell me how to talk about black people. Like, what were, their, what were some of their pointers? Whew. Um, there was one time I wanted to um, go into the city. I'm not going to say the city, but there was a... Um, there were some brothers in the city who had been doing a um, neighborhood watch. A lot of them were like fresh out of prison. A lot of them were ex-gang members. Um, they didn't have any pedigrees. They weren't from college and all that stuff. These were just street cats. But they would make sure these kids got to school and keep out of like, um, from the, the dealers and the hustlers knew not to mess with them because these dudes were on the street. I wanted to interview them and they told me straight up that wasn't an interesting story. Basically told me nobody wants to hear that. Really? What have, where, where are these guys now? We got to get them on the show. That's interesting as hell, bro. That brother's like, damn, that's... But what's the, what is the goal of mainstream media and news at, from your experience, knowing that they think that that type of shit is not important? What is important? Um, ratings. That's what they care about, ratings. However way they can get them. Even in news? Especially in news. News, or what you want to call mainstream news, or hard news, is a loss leader for most corporations. You got to understand, like, most news that you get comes from maybe two, three, maybe four corporations right now in the United States. Four major corporations control 98% of the news that you get. So they're concerned about turning over money for their shareholders, and they're concerned about getting ratings and whatever. 
They don't really care. I mean, there's a certain level of fact checking that has to go on, but they're more concerned about getting to a story first than getting it right. That's just the truth. If they can, tell, if they can, if they can get paid from a story about somebody falling out in the street, they'll sell that. If they can get paid from somebody throwing a rock through a building, they'll sell that. Okay, so what is it really then? It's entertainment. Carlos Miller here, and I get DMs all the time saying, Los, man, how can I make sure I leave my girl satisfied? If you were paying attention, I've been giving you the game the whole time. Get you some Blue Chew. Blue Chew is a unique online service that delivers the same active ingredients as Viagra and Cialis. The first step is simple. Visit BlueChew.com, then consult with one of their licensed medical providers, and once you're approved, you'll receive your prescription within days. You can take them anytime, day or night, so you can plan ahead or be ready whenever an opportunity arises. So if you can benefit from extra confidence when it's time to perform, Blue Chew can help. And we've got a special deal for our listeners. Try Blue Chew for free when you use promo code BLACK. B-L-A-C-K at checkout. Just pay $5 shipping. That's bluechew.com, promo code B-L-A-C-K to receive your first month free. Visit bluechew.com for more details and important safety information. And we thank Blue Chew for sponsoring this podcast. So all the people who are watching the news who think they are getting legit information is just simply being entertained. Yeah, for the most part. There's exceptions, but for the most part, you're just looking at the same thing running over and over and over on the loop. And then when you get into black people and how people report on black people, that's a whole nother animal. Like, how do they report on black people? Or like, they're uh... They report on black people like the circus. Basically, if something Like happens, the circus? Yeah. You ever notice, like, every time something happens on the block or there's a story that happens in the neighborhood that's not upper middle class, they found the wildest person they can find on the street, and they put, they put a camera in front of them and let them talk. Yeah. You know what I mean? Not to say that that person doesn't have a valid point, but you know, they get somebody who's going to act a fool so they can go viral, and they generate I think they be trying to find those people, because those, I don't know. That's a good thing and a bad thing. The bad thing is, it's embarrassing. The good thing is, these people tell you exactly what the fuck happened. <laughs> I want to get some gas. <laughs> and that man came out of the gun. And then man shot a gun and came out of the car and hit out of the car and then boom, everything blowed up. I saw everything. It happened right in front of me. My baby got out of the car and came out. Everything happened right there. I seen everything. Yep. Just like that. Now that's embarrassing as fuck, but that man told you everything that happened in that bitch wasn't the detail left out. I mean, sometimes that's funny. Like, remember the guy, the guy who caught, who rescued the girls that were in that house a couple years ago? Oh, man, that's some of the best, that's some yeah. of the best shit that has ever happened. See, people love the dead giveaway. The golden part of that interview was when that man said, I used to eat ribs with that. Salsa dad. Yeah. He was a salsa dad, eat ribs. <laughs> Just as, man, where is that footage? <laughs> Charles Rams over there with the slick bag, the yeah, saucy dancing, cool. big ass rib. Man, come on. He dropped a cigarette out of his head one time and picked it up. Come on, me. man. Come on. He even rescued the hell out of them. Now, he still ain't get everything he was supposed to get for that. Yeah, and see, that's the other part of it, too. When black people who move like that get the notoriety, they're not able to capitalize on stuff like the way somebody who's white or whatever does that. Because you see white people like in the food, too, and they walk in the record, they walk into contracts, they walk into endorsement deals. I don't know what Charles Ramsey got. I right. saw him maybe smoke cigarettes. Well, I don't know. I know he ain't really get the real, you know, the real, like, respect that he deserved. Mm -hmm. These are people's lives right here. However funny the interview is, it's like, he still did a great thing. And then, like I said, like you said, it was here one day, gone the next. Yeah. So that's why I moved out of mainstream media and started doing my own thing, because I felt like, you know, after being on the grind and watching how people were able to tell stories, I'm like, you know what? The technology is here. I can do this myself. I don't really need anybody to help me with this, and I can say what I want to say. That's where, that's where technology is, is pushing everybody to go independent. Mm -hmm. Like, have you found more success on your own terms as opposed to going in and having to try to figure out what these people are in the mood for today? Well, yeah, in a way. I mean, I found success whereas I have freedom to be able to say what I want to say and I can fact check it myself and I can put it out and I don't have to go through a lot of filters. 
But it's hard to do that by yourself because you don't have the, you're not plugged into the apparatus where like, you know, I can call CNN or I can call um, MSNBC and say, hey, put this out, put this out. So what kind of advice are you giving right now to the young up and coming black journalists? Um, I don't normally give advice, but what I would say is everybody has a story and everybody's story is valid. And you have a right to tell that story. And don't let anybody who's not in your culture who doesn't know you dissuade you from telling that story. I mean, everybody has one. Everybody has a right to. You don't have to you have 15 degrees to be able to tell somebody a story. If somebody trusts you and they sit down with you, that's all you really need. As long as you don't break that, you're good. What kind of, what kind of literature would you point them to, books uh, that may help? Um, one book that I, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan of and has helped me out is um, Gordon Parks' autobiography. Gordon Parks so fucking dope, man. Gordon Parks was doing stuff that um, it's wild because some of the ground he was breaking in the 40s, in the, in the 1930s, being one of the few black photographers and journalists working in mainstream media. Yeah, his photography is so dope, just like, even without the context of, you know, his writing, it's just, you can take out all these books and shit you could just see, rare images. So. Yeah, and he was, really, he was really instrumental in me teaching me how, about the power of an image. You know, you can, you can talk and you can write, but that's only going to catch a certain amount of people. If you have video and you have technology married together and you put these images together and you can show people what's really going on, yeah. that's, um, that's extremely powerful. And that says more than just what you can write. Well, shit, man. Let them know where they can find you at. Where we can, where we can get some links to some of your print media and things of that nature. Um, you can find me at the site, Context Media Group. That's the website. All my social media is Context Media, and you can find me, um, Torrin Walker, mostly on Twitter. I'm on that way more than I need to be, but I'm Man, you be on that, bro. You see everything. Yeah, I see a lot. <laughs> I see a lot, too, but you know, for better for worse. <laughs> so that's where you can find my stuff. That's what's up, man. Anything you want to leave me with before we wrap it up? You got a question? Yeah. Uh, after the last election and, like, the way that it transpired, Mm -hmm. Media, where do you think the ethical code like, lies now for journalists? Journalists gotta stop. A lot of people not gonna like this, but journalists gotta stop being groupies and start being journalists again. There's too much, there's too much um, cheerleading on both sides. If you're there to get a story, don't go, go there to get a story and per, impress these people. A lot of these people, I know what you're talking about, a lot of these people ran on I'm black, ski wee, and all this type of stuff. If you're gonna go to and beat in these people's face, you need to hit them with hard questions that don't um, take selfies. Be a journalist. I'm probably not gonna get invited to the White House dinner now, but I mean it but is. But you are though. You are. They got a quota. All right. You gonna be in there, man. Don't worry about that, bro. White House dinner. You gonna be straight, man. Hey, the black market is open. My man Torin Walker. 85 South Show. We out of here. Get your journalism game together. Groupies. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, bro. Hell yeah. My food is here.